Friends, welcome back. We are joined by a very special guest today in the name of Alexander Barnes Ross, and he hails from London, and he's going to be telling us about his experiences in the London org and as a London Scientologist. Um, real briefly, his story is he got into Scientology or was introduced to it when he was 16, and then he very quickly got onto staff, got booted out, was convinced to come back in, and then got booted out again. Was he declared an SP or was he not? Stay tuned to find out. But we're going to briefly run through his story. And he has many interesting tidbits that we'll probably segue off of along the way. So first off, Alexander, I really appreciate you coming on. It's tough to speak out, as we know. And it can be hard sometimes to get exes to come on here. So kudos to your bravery and thanks for joining us, man. And thanks for having me. I think, you know, your channel, I, I did an interview with Chris Shelton recently, which was um, the first kind of time I spoke publicly about this. And so, um, you know, these channels like yours are really important to help people in the recovery process. And just watching your stories of, and interviews of other people uh, is really interesting and, and is definitely helpful. So thanks for, for doing it and thanks for having me on as well. Sure, man. And welcome to the crew, man. Welcome to the uh, the SPs on the outside. It's so much better on the outside, isn't it? Than all the bullshit <laughs> you're, you had to deal with that we're just that we're going to talk about now. For sure. OK, so let's start from the beginning, Alexander. How exactly did Scientology come onto your radar? Yeah, so I, I don't come from a religious family or anything. My family aren't Scientologists. I kind of stumbled across it um i actually watched the bbc panorama documentary um that they did about scientology with john sweeney and mike rinder when he was stood in the the church um and i thought it was kind of like a bit mean really and i kind of wanted to find out for myself what like whether it was true and whether scientology is a horrible destructive cult and a bad thing or whether it was you know just reporting that it was biased or the, you know the reporters have pissed some people off so um went in just to, like find out for myself you know make up my own mind whether it was actually as controversial as they made it seem um so did a personality test and then went in to get my results um and did a, a course or two um just as a public and um i never really had like a ruin because in scientology when you're recruiting people in it's all about finding the thing in that person's life right. that you want to change right or something they don't like about themselves or something you've got a problem with and Scientology then is um, molded to be the solution to that um, so I didn't really have that because I was a teenager I was like 15 16 at the time um, so it was you know just kind of interested to find out more um, and yeah did a couple of courses and and before long I was um, recruited onto staff um, which was a very quick process in the space of you know six months or a year or something of oh, wow. first walking into the org to then being on staff. Um, and I loved it, right? I was a teenager. The people there were really young, around the same sort of age, a little bit older, but really young crew and really nice people. And we used to go and do fun things. I was in Div 6, which is the book selling division. So it's very public facing and it meant that we would go out every week to sell books and meet new people. And it was really, really fun. I enjoyed it. Um, and then, yeah, after a couple of months, got kicked out and then rejoined a few years later and got kicked out again. And now we're here. <laughs> hey, let me let me. Um, OK, so there, there you go. That's the brief story. But so let's take it from um, just for people that don't know. This is the. Um, this is the Sweeney reference that he's talking to. John Sweeney uh, did a famous. He was caught by Scientology. He was riled up by Tommy Davis and they quote unquote pushed his buttons over and over and over again until he finally exploded. And so this is the video that you actually saw before you got in, eh? Like yeah, you had seen absolutely. this? So let's yeah, and I, mm -hmm. I saw this and I kind of thought, God, for something to have made a report to have this reaction, um, either it is exactly what they're saying is a really bad thing or the reporters just had some disagreement and is, you know, trying to make it seem as bad as possible and therefore is, is biased. So I kind of right. saw this that we're about to see and thought, well, you know, I want to know for myself whether it is bad or whether this guy is just a bad reporter, right? That makes a lot of sense, man. I mean, it's easy for me to know what Scientology is about now and saying, you know, why would anybody join after seeing this? But yeah, that's a pretty balanced viewpoint. Here's what Alexander saw, and this is before he joined. I'm not an expert on brainwashing. And when asked in that case why he kept making the accusation, Sweeney's reaction was unexpected, to say the least. 
That is a guy clearly, you know, being broken. Remember, they were following him around, and you know, he's a professional, and he just absolutely snapped. And that's exactly what Scientology tried to capture, so they could use that in their PR to show all their people that Scientology is great. Okay, so after, by the way, can you also tell people? You don't have to be too personal, man. I don't. You don't necessarily have to say what your ruin is, but can you describe sort of the process, uh, real briefly about you know what did they do, Alexander? Did they do the personality test? Did they sit you down? Did they take you into a locked room? And how intense was the ruin finding process? And what exactly is that for people that might not know? Yeah, I mean, for me, as I said, I didn't really have like a ruin or a problem that I was trying to solve or wanted Mm -hmm. to fix. So I'm kind of an an odd case because normally the whole point is to try and find that thing that someone's not happy about with their life. And then you present Scientology as the as the answer or the solution to that. Um, And so the way that, that it is done is you do a personality test, which asks you a load of questions. It's kind of like, yes, maybe no type situation um do you ever think this do you ever feel like this and then your results get plotted on a graph called the oxford capacity analysis graph and then presented to you when you go into the church and they kind of map out your life in different um areas so you know you it might show that you might have low confidence or high confidence or i can't remember the exact points off the top of my head but it kind of pl- plots it on a graph um and then you sit down and someone talks you through the results and kind of says look so this is what your personality test shows um and these are the areas that you know you might be um you know you might want to work on or you might do you agree with it or not and I kind of was like eh, I mean kind of I don't know I'm a teenager I don't still trying to find myself right and you know I guess you know that's something that could potentially be worked on I don't know and they basically sold me a course personal efficiency course which was um you read the book problems of work by Oren Hubbard and you basically do um you know, like a, a test on it type thing. You kind of read the book and then you answer questions on on that segment of the book and hand it in. Um, and it was like £30 or something. These are the really cheap introductory um, sort of courses that they sell to people to get them in and say, look, Scientology isn't this big, expensive, horrible thing. You can get started for 30 quid and you do the course and then see how see how it works. And it's not like, giving a book to you and saying this is what we believe read this and make up your own mind it's more this is what L. Ron Hubbard says about this or this is a technique or this is a you know technology or try doing this and see you know what you think whether you agree with it or not whether it works so it's kind of very itty bitty little tools and and that sort of thing Um, And you kind of agree to kind of go in you know once a week or every day for an hour or two you kind of set a schedule with the course supervisor as to when you want to study so I was I think I was at school at the time so I used to come in after school and you know go up there and do a couple of hours of study once a week and get to know everyone and I think the thing that sold it for me wasn't necessarily that Oxford capacity analysis graph thing personality test it was more everyone there was really nice and really friendly um can you ask that sound if there are any Siomika Katty Holler uh i don't recognize that name i'm afraid mark um there was a katia that i remember um i have to look up her last name um yeah good question um but yeah so for me it was like these this group of people were um a really nice community they were driven to try and Mm -hmm. um do the same thing they had a cause to try and help people save the planet i think that's what sucked me in was this group of people that I could get along with and we're all trying to achieve the same thing um and I, I liked being there it was all young people it was fun it was cool and um that's I think what sold it to me was the community aspect and the nice people rather than you you have a problem with communication and here's a fix to that if that makes sense it does it does make sense that's interesting though so no ruin found you didn't walk out of there because Alexander when I was you know a kid 
um, they broke me down completely. And I know they broke down my dad that day and they definitely found his ruin, but they, you didn't really have a ruin to find and it wasn't that intense and you didn't necessarily take to it because of the problems of work or the, the tech, you simply liked the community and the young kids and the vibe that was going on that, down there. Yeah, and I think also I had a very inquisitive mind. So I wanted to mm -hmm. know and understand more about people and the way people work and the way the reason people are the way they are and understand more about humanity, et cetera. And that's what the course kind of did. It sort of said, well, look, if you've ever been in a situation like this, that's because the brain works like this, or this is because X, Y, Z happens and therefore the person reacts in that way. And it kind of, yeah, well, I can see how that would make sense. You know, um, one of the things that they teach in the book is if you're feeling confused, if there's like lots of um, stuff going on around you and, you know, it's a really high intense environment, you can get stressed out. And one of the tools they say is we'll find what they call a stable datum, you know, find something that is, right. you know, can ground you and go, OK, well, I know for a fact that this is true or this is something that has happened and from there, you can then work out, you know, what else has happened. And then you can use that stable datum to find, you know, to think about things logically and assess things in a kind of logical, practical way, rather than getting confused and angry and all over the place and stuff like that. So it's little things like that, little tools that you go, OK, let's let's try and uh, I can see how that might work. And, you know, no disagreements, if that makes sense. Totally. And Alexander asked, um, did you ever witness any OT failing in life that made you question the effectiveness? This would be before, during, or maybe even after. Your, well, how about how about at the beginning? Or in other words, did you run across any OTs? That's a great question, Angela, because this this I really want to know. Like, how do you go from personal efficiency course, and then you very got quick got quickly on staff, which we'll cover. But in between there, and as you're getting introduced to these concepts, these heady concepts of the bridge, you can go totally free. And this concept of OT, which by the way, for the listeners that may not know, that stands for operating Phaeton. And that's kind of what you're trying to be in Scientology. And at the top of the bridge, they have confidential levels called OT levels, which only about 5% of people get up to. And they cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to get up there. My dad was an OT when I was a teenager. He was auditing, um, I remember on OT3 when I was in high school. And I felt like he could read my mind. And that absolutely played into me falling into Scientology eventually. What was your introduction to this concept of OTs right away? And like Angela says, did you observe these people as special? And did you notice anything about them? I mean, at the time, the only OTs really were older people who'd been in Scientology a long time. Mm -hmm. um, who There weren't really too many like young people who were OT. And it's not really something that there's never a point where they go, oh, hey, Alex, this is so-and-so who's OT8 or OT5 or whatever. It's mm -hmm. kind of the more you learn about it, the more you understand what it is, you know, then you're like, oh, that person's OT. Okay, that's cool. Um, the kind of idea is when you're OT, that means you have like cause over life, right? So you mm -hmm. um, are completely in control of everything that happens in your environment. And, you know, it's an interesting question because the OTs that I knew at the time, there was one or two people who were, fairly young in their like mid to late 20s who had done mm. the OT levels and gone up the bridge and then joined staff they were quite cool and you know I got on really well with them but there were the majority of OTs were kind of the senior senior execs head of the church right. you know and right. the, the really high up execs who had been in Scientology since the 70s or 80s and um, they were really nice upbeat people and for their age they're the sort of people that go oh cool you know I want to be like that when I'm when I'm that age I want to have that lust for life and enjoyment but there wasn't a point where I was like oh my god you're OT that's amazing you know there wasn't anything like that but it was just you could tell they had a, a drive in life rather than hitting the age of 60 or 70 and thinking right that's me done I'm gonna sit down and retire now they were still like going for it right which right which is cool but there wasn't anything like noticeable I would say at 16, were you looking for the kind of spiritual powers that Scientology offered? Were you more interested in the practical stuff like you were learning on the PE? Or what was kind of the thing that was um, intriguing you or keeping you in there? Yeah, I think I think spiritually wasn't really a big thing. Like I said, I don't really come from like a spiritual or religious background. Um, I did go to, uh, I moved around quite a lot as a kid. So I went to like a few different schools and two of them were church schools, not because uh -huh. of my family being religious just because they were local and had good results. 
Um, so, you know, I had an awareness of it, but I would never have considered myself religious. Um, you know, I was open to whatever, but I, it wasn't a focus for me. For me, it was more, yeah, just I want to be a part of a group of like-minded people um, and they're clearly trying to help others. And that was a really big thing for me. I want to help people in my life mm -hmm. and make other people's lives great. And that's, I think, what really sold it for me rather than the spiritual journey, if that makes that sense. That makes sense. Were you taken aback by the... Um the uptoneness, the enthusiasm, the ability for these guys to get things done, you know, and I know it's an intense environment and you add in the love bombing and the electricity in an orb. It seems like, you know, these are people that are doing something special. Was there something special about it, man, that captured you just by the confidence of these Scientologists? You know, you know what I'm talking about, right? There's something a little bit different about these people, right? Yeah, I think because I come into it having seen bad press about Scientology previously mm -hmm. um, and hearing all these stories and watching things and you know hearing that Scientologists are a bit weird and they're you know kind of really intense and all of this I think mm -hmm. I was very hyper aware of that and kind of looking out for it almost and I didn't really see it I think in London we're all kind of a bit in the org toned down almost in that we're aware that that's the image that we have and we want to we try hard to not come across like that because we know that weirds people out so there is an element of toning it down and trying to seem like just normal people that you can get along with. Um, but there is the confidence, like you say, the assertiveness that what they're doing is the answer and the solution. And they'll do that with dedication and drive. And you see that when you become a staff member and the focus on statistics and really trying to achieve your goals and, and meet your quotas, etc. You know, that's when you see, look, we are working really, really hard to get this done and we fully believe in the tech and all of this but public facing we kind of have to take a step back almost and think look other people might find this weird who have no knowledge of Scientology whatsoever so let's just be aware of that and be you know a bit calmer I suppose but there was the intensity you know when we were selling books trying to our job was to find someone's ruin you know find out what is the problem with their life and then sell Dianetics as the solution to that that's what I did every day. Um, and, you know, once you found out someone's ruin, you have that focus to be like, right, this is, and you, you are focused and committed to getting them to buy the book however you possibly can. Um, but you don't, you're not like that intensely the first time you meet them. You don't go, hi, I'm Alex, and you're going to buy this book for me. It's going to change your right. life. Because people just go, what the hell, go away. You know, I want to ask you how you actually sold somebody. You said you originally, before we went live here, you were looking to join OSA that, or, or their video production also caught your attention with their slick ads yeah. and everything. And they promised you perhaps, you know, they could send you to gold and you can work in that department. But how the hell did you wind up in something that you weren't even interested in being the, the bookstore officer, the BSO? And then also, Alexandra, how did you go from just doing a course to getting on staff, did they, like they did to me and a lot of people, hit you up constantly? Because as soon as they have raw meat in there, a new person, it's almost like right away they're hitting you up to join staff because that's that they hit on the students to to do that. Were they constantly on you like sharks, or how did they go about getting you on staff? Um, I can't. It, it was this was eight years ago, nine years ago, something like mm -hmm. that. So I'm just trying to remember how exactly it happened. I don't remember like them being particularly intense about it I mean I was I'd just finished school because in the UK I finished school at 16 before going on to do an optional at the time it was optional two years before going to university um, you do mm -hmm. college or sixth form so I was kind of I'd finished school and had the summer to kind of you know do what I want to do and I was enjoying my time at Scientology and you know I just kind of did more courses and throughout that process I think they just saw that I was quite a a confident person and was like happy and you know very theta they call it yeah. um and got on with everyone and was kind of agreeing with what they were saying and I think they were just like well look you get on with everyone here we like you you know you, you know let's let why don't you try coming on staff and I was like yeah I can join staff but in September I'm gonna have to leave staff because I have to go back to school um for the last two years and they were like yeah that's not a problem that's fine um, but you have to sign a two and a half year contract minimum. It's two and a half or five years mm -hmm. as a staff member. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea was either I would leave staff and go back to school or we would figure out a way of me not going back to school and just 
gene Scientology and I was open to either sort of discussion at the time. Um, but I was really interested at the time in, in law. Um, I really wanted to become a lawyer and the plan was to go to university and study that and then go down that route. It's not what I ended up doing, um, but there's a section in OSA, which is the Office of Special Affairs, which is the sort of um, dirty tricks segment of the church who are the people who instigate the John Sweeney reaction we saw earlier. OSA mm -hmm. are the people responsible for public relations, for the lawsuits, anything that kind of um, is a potential attack against Scientology as their department. Um, so I kind of saw on their, you know, structure of the, the organisation, there was a legal section and I was like, well, look, I'm interested in law. I want to go and do that with my life. So they kind of pitched it in the, cool, well, you can work in the legal section and get some experience working with law lawsuits and law cases and learn mm -hmm. about it. And I was like, absolutely amazing, great. So once I joined staff, you do um, like a few tests and things where they kind of figure out what you're like and what sort of lead you're going to be and where you'd be best placed and they said that the results would show i'd be better in like a public facing um div six role division six is the public facing sales of books and things like that um and it's not what i wanted to do but i was like yeah sure why not so kind of agreed to do that and did that for the summer and yeah that's where we ended up alexander what did they use to test you to find out where you belong i've, I've never heard that before I can't remember what it was called, but there was like, so we had to do a life history where you get put in mm -hmm. front of a computer and they ask you every question about your right. life and who you are and who you slept with and who your family are and literally everything um, to find out who you are and what you're about. And then there was another thing, I can't remember what it's called, but it's a bit like the, um, the personality test where they asked you questions and it kind of plotted you on a competency based thing of like where you would be best placed. You never got, I never got the results. Um, it was passed on to a senior who then afterward would review it and come up to me and say, right, great, we think you'd be good in, in this post. Interesting. Were you none too enthused when they put you on the bookstore as opposed to, you know, working for OSA and doing the law? Or were you, did you have any idea what you were getting into? Because that, that's, that's the one I, that's the last one I'd want to be in because you have to confront public. I imagine you had to go out on the streets to strangers and hawk the science, the Dianetics book, right? Yeah, I mean, it wasn't where I wanted to go. And I was I remember being a bit like annoyed about it, but I was like, fair enough, well let's let's give it a go and see see what it's like and see if I enjoy it. Um and what was it like, Alexander? Because I we had Marcus on a few weeks ago, Marcus Sawyer, and he's in Theta in the chat. What's up, brother? Um, and you know, he had to he has amazing stories about him and his brother going out and selling and I tried it briefly and in Hollywood Boulevard, you know, it almost get murdered or whatever, just for, you know, because we, everybody out here knew we were Scientologists and we were, you know, but we had to confront. So we'd go into, you know, horrible neighborhoods and stuff. What was a typical uh, day on the, were you sent out on the street in addition to, you know, being at the org? And what, what were some encounters like with people? How, how many books and shit did you sell? Yeah, it was really fun because the Div really? 6 was staffed by young people who were around the same sort of age as me. Um, and we used to go out. Our, so our, there's two orgs in, in an organization. It's like day and foundation. So day is like 9, 10 a.m. till 6 p.m. And then from 6 p.m. till 10 p.m. is the foundation, which is kind of like a completely different org, um, but in the same building. So there's two sets of staff. But obviously people in London are at work during the day. So you're not really going to get too many books sold at two o'clock in the afternoon on Wednesday. So what we would do is we would go out book selling in the evenings, um, uh, you know, the, the three or four of us in the Div, Div 6 and then a couple of other staff members and a few FSMs who are public who just want to help out. Um, and yeah, we would go and set up tables and do stress tests. We would get the oh, meter right. out and Right. you know get people off the street and and give them a stress test and sell them the book and it was really good fun because it's funny because mm -hmm. i hadn't actually read dianetics at the time but i was selling it um right. and it was right. just really fun because the people who i was hanging out with were were nice people and it was something fun to do i was on my summer break from school so it's not like i was doing anything else and mm -hmm. you know it was just a a fun enjoyable thing um and yes i did that for a while and then the end of the summer came where I then had to go back to school. So um, left the org and like left staff, but then continued as a public um, until October came, which was when the annual IAS event happened. Um, so IAS is the International Association of Scientologists. Mm -hmm. um, and every year they have a big event where they get together and talk about all the great things that we've done as a church this year and all of the 
um, humanitarian efforts, getting people off drugs, etc. And it's a really big event for Scientologists, and it's broadcast worldwide to every Scientologist on the planet. So that is that's held at St. Hill in East Grinstead, which is the headquarters in the UK of Scientology. Um, and that's only an hour, hour and a half, I think, from London. Um, so I was basically planning to go to that in October and bring my mum along, who wasn't a Scientologist. Oh, no shit. With the view to kind of not convert her, but get her to be OK with her son being um, a part of this controversial group. Right. Um, right. And ended up not going um, because apparently there was a connection a friend of a friend or of a friend or something knew someone who had a bad experience of Scientology um and that was enough for them to say look you can't come to the event because you're connected to a suppressive person and so on so um they phoned us up the night before and said you can't come your um, mom was considered a suppressive person Alexander no 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 because she had spoken to someone who'd spoken to someone who has a friend or a cousin right. or something. No shit. You know? They tracked, they, you're, you're, so your mom couldn't go because they, they ran her connections and they found yeah. out that she was connected to someone who's connected to someone who's connected to someone. Yeah, ex exactly. Wow. And so because of that, they said you can't come. So and I was kicked off as a public. Like I'd already really? start, but I was still studying. And they said, look, you can't come into the org because this connection. And just because and of that, it. Alexander, what was, what actually yeah. was the connection? Like who was the SP five people down from that? From I don't that? know. We didn't even ever meet them or speak to them. Like it was just her really? reaching out and trying to figure out, you know, my son's involved in this controversial thing. Right. I want to find out more about it. And just like anyone did researching it and of course. You know, came through the grapevine. That there was someone that, had a bad experience would you like to speak to them never did never met up or, or anything but um that was enough for them to kind of kick me off and so yeah it was banned from going to the event banned from going to the church and I was a bit pissed off at the time but then had a couple of years where I was at school and over that period of time was then picked up um by someone who worked at Flag which is in um, Florida who was just basically trying to get me back on um, onto lines at the org and, and back into studying and back into good standing. Um, and they handled it and we did what's called a board of review where they look at what happened and kind of, you know, investigate it. And they basically did this board review that said, look, we, we were wrong. We shouldn't have kicked you off um, off lines. The policy wasn't applied correctly. Um, and yeah, you can come back in, um, which is what I ultimately did um and then once i finished school two years later yeah got back in and then joined back staff, in the staff or, alexander or yeah so you got booted off of staff at this point just because of that connection that your mom had when you innocently wanted yeah. to bring her to an event so they booted you off staff and then they brought you back in on staff not not public yeah so as soon as i got back in i was like look let's let's go back in and join staff but during this process um i don't know how but i kind of managed to find that lust for it again and um signed my seal contract so no for those shit. who don't know the seal is like the monks and nuns of scientology they dedicate their lives to um to the religion and working for the church um oh sorry hold on no that's not it's yeah. not him it's it's me right stop prop propaganda please try not to bang your desk or mic it's very distracting if you're hearing me by the way uh stop press the buttons and stuff and that's picking up on the mic please let me know because i don't want people to keep you know here and being annoyed by that thanks for letting us know i don't um, think it's you alexander i'll try to okay um <laughs> in days of doug stop it get your TRs. I off. <laughs> i'm sorry man marcus my trs are in just let me know i have the computer like right here to press on these uh the chat so if, if you guys are hearing the buttons and it's annoying let me know and i'll move the mic away <laughs> um, but yeah so kind of found this lust for it again and, and signed my seal contract which um is a one billion year contract it's not um they kind of say it's not legally binding because you can't there's no way you could legally sign a billion year contract but it's more of a spiritual dedication to show that you will dedicate this life and all future lives to Scientology. And it's a sign of like your dedication, if that makes sense. It's it's sort of a metaphor, but, and how did you take it though? Did you take it literally? Did you scoff at it? Did you think it was ridiculous? People often ask, how on earth is anybody going to sign a billionaire contract? But as you say, it's generally sold just to show the commitment, but you're new, you know, you only been there six months. What did you think of that? The freaking billionaire contract. I mean, at this point I'd been in for, I was in on staff for six months, eight months, something like that. And okay. then 
this was two a year or two after that that um i'd been kicked off and then got back in and was studying extension courses so i was studying the books and things from home on my computer online um so this was i'd been in for two years or something at this point okay um and signing it was kind of yeah it was a point of that's where your mind is at that you're i'm willing to do this but there is also something in the back of my mind thinking realistically if i break this contract they're not going to take me to court because it's not legally enforceable but it wasn't really part of my thought process it was more yes i'm i'm willing to do that so sign a seal contract and then join staff again and so you um, did become a sea org member well, someone asked kind of no. like I signed my seal contract and was ready to do it. And the idea mm -hmm. was then to move over to America and, and do that full time. But as a kind of stepping stone, because um, that was going to take a while to work out, let's, you know, join staff again. And while I was on staff, we were working on this program to then get me arrived in the SEALG. So I never did my EPF or anything like that, which is the oh. training and initiation you do as a SEALG member. Um, but I was a staff member with this process underway to try and get that to happen. Um, and it's to show a sign of my dedication where my mind was at, that I was willing to dedicate my life to this thing. Yeah. Um, I signed a contract to do that. So I kind of went in really gung ho, like I'm, I'm ready to be a SEAL member and do this properly. Um, yeah, that's, that's how I got there. So you, how did, how is it that you never qualified for Sea Org? Did you, how the heck did you, did that not go through? Cause they're, they really want to get people, you know, to sign that. And I know that there's a whole thing that they have to put you through. They have to check your background. Sometimes you have to sell everything because you're going to literally dedicate the rest of your life to that. How did that not go through? And also, Alexander, you said that you kind of had schooling. I wanted to back up one real quick and just ask you one question on the staff thing. My understanding is that once you sign that two and a half and or five year contract, there's no breaks. You have to freaking serve the thing. You know, they wouldn't let me leave until I was done with the two and a half years. So. They were going to let you go back to school legitimately and come back on staff, or were they going to trap you and just tell you that you can leave and go back to school? But that wasn't their intention. Do you know what I mean? Um, the first time I left staff and I was like, look, I have to go back to school. That's that mm -hmm. has to happen now. They and kind they of accepted you. it. Really? So, I, and yeah. they let you. Okay. I didn't yeah, know you I mean, actually they, break they, that up. They, they weren't happy about it, but they were like, look, that's is the way it is. Um mm -hmm. And they were trying to convince me not to. And I was like, look, I, you know, I just have to do this. Um, the idea was just to go back to school and then, you know, come back and finish the contract after school, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, and then after that was then kicked out of the IS event and therefore banned from doing any Scientology. So when I rejoined a year or two later, it wasn't like I was continuing my contract. I signed a new nice. contract and started oh. again. Um, and yeah, there was always a battle between there's quite a few staff members that had signed their seal contract but hadn't um moved over to the seal yet because <laughs> right all really tried hard to keep a hold of their staff members because yeah it's great that you're joining the sea org but that means we lose a staff member and we need the staff so there was always this battle going on and i think because i was good at my job selling books because i was promoted to director of public book sales at this point so i was in charge of all oh, of the nice. sales of books in london and malta was one of our missions interestingly but basically all books sold came under my that was my stat and i was doing well at it we did really good we did a really good job so therefore they were like look we can't lose you because we need you our stats going up he's doing really good and i was enjoying it and i wasn't in any rush to to go and join the seal because you know, you've, I've just signed my life and every other life I'm ever going to live to join this yeah. thing. Who cares if it takes another two years? Who it doesn't matter because I've got, you know, a billion afterwards to <laughs> to finish the job. So, and you were buying into that? Was the was that going in a little bit? Uh, again, like you were just doing it for the cause and the people that were around you, or was some part of that tech starting to click with you? Did you were you yeah. becoming? Uh, were you drinking the Kool Aid more and starting to bleed more and more in Hubbard's tech and something? In other words, most people wouldn't give their life away for a billion years. You're young, you still have schooling and the rest of your, your life. What made you cross that bridge to actually be willing to do that? Because they tried to get me to sign that forever, bro. Yeah, I mean, I signed the contract because I, um, you know, I saw the results, right? Like I saw people mm -hmm. going into the org with um an issue with communication doing a course and then being better at it like i saw it genuinely working on people right. and 
you know, there were there weren't like I said, didn't really have a ruin, but you know, doing the technology, applying technology and being a part of this group made me feel good and I was enjoying it and everyone was really happy. And I thought, well, look, what's the harm? There's no harm done here. Everyone's having a good time. Um, it clearly works on other people. And I can't wait to get to the point where I start getting really good, you know, wins and and so on. So it was interesting that I wasn't sold on the whole, my ruin wasn't solved, if that makes sense. It was like, I just saw it work on other people. I was happy. I was enjoying it. And it was a really positive environment. Everyone was trying to achieve this goal of helping people and saving the planet, clearing the planet. Yeah. And I was like, cool, let's do that. You know, what's what's the harm done? I found something I can do with my life because I was, you know, at this point, 17 or 18 or something. And I was like, I need to find what I want to do with my life. And this is it. It helps people. And that's it. Wow. And this is a perfect story. You guys know I was born into it. And a lot of people that speak out, you know, are second and third gen. But we've had a couple of examples um, recently, you know, with Marcus uh, on and other people where, yeah, this is how you get sucked in. And also Mark Turry, you know, he was just we had him on a couple of weeks ago. He was just out vacationing in Hollywood, went to the L. Ron Hubbard Life Exhibition Museum. And before you knew it, he was also on staff. So it's just, it's just interesting, man, because I was born into it. So I like to hear people's ideas of what exactly is attracting them. Because I don't know what the hell was attracting me. I drank the Kool-Aid, you know, by the time I was 10 or 11 and my dad was feeding it to me and stuff. Did you, um, during the book sales, did you, didn't you have a story where you sold um, or you did a stress test with John Sweeney himself? <laughs> yeah, this is only a short story. It's quite funny. So John Sweeney, the guy we saw the video of earlier, shouting and all of that he's the biggest suppressive person in Scientology's mind yeah. a lot of that BBC panorama uh, documentary was filmed in London because he's a BBC reporter mm-hmm. um, and we were out book selling on Edgware Road um, because the Scientology org there's two buildings there's Tottenham Court Road which is called the test center which is a smaller building where it's just like a public information center I think they do deliver some courses there now but it's very much like just a, a really high um traffic area in the center of london that lots of people are walking past we use that to sell books the main org itself is kind of in the financial district it's on queen victoria street which is near all the banks and law firms and that sort of thing near st paul's cathedral so it's not really a high footfall area so we didn't really sell many books there there wasn't people walking in off the street because the street was it's not a busy street so we did a lot of book selling at Tonical Road, but then also went to Edgware Road to book sell and put up these tables and do stress tests every week. Edgware Road is, um, you know, a very high traffic area in the evenings, lots of people going out to have dinner and that sort of thing. And we were kind of, you know, doing our thing and body routing. So getting people to come over, hello, would you like to come and have a stress test or whatever? And I was like giving out leaflets and trying to get people over. And I offered this guy this, you know, leaflet and said, Do you want to come and get a stress test? And then I looked up and realized it was John Sweeney. And I was no like, shit. Oh. And he had loads of cameras and everything filming something. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh God, here we go. All right. Okay. And so I went back and um told my the rest of the staff i was like look guys john john sweeney's here i just offered him a stress test not knowing Uh-oh. who he was and you're in trouble we were, uh, you're in trouble in alexander he's, he's an sp uh, and you talk to the sp right you didn't get yeah, any but, trouble for that no i didn't get in any trouble we were just kind of like what do we do so we phoned mark pinchin who's the director of um special affairs who's in charge of that osa section we were talking about earlier and said what do we do and he said look we don't want any trouble let's just not let's just pack up and go um so that's exactly what we did and we packed up got in the car and left that's um, right and it turns out he was actually filming another panorama thing about something completely different he just happened to be there at the same time we were and he just kind of went his own way and walked off and didn't cause the scene or anything so it was really kind of non-event uh, but i know there were lots of reports written and lots of background you know panicking of like why is he here is he doing yeah. the documentary and so absolutely anytime you see sweeney around scientologists you know he's trying to get the story and the scoop yeah what was it like actually um what was your reaction from the public in general when you tried to sit him down uh during the stress test well sneers would they go oh you're in it would they ever walk by alexander and go cult cult and then and then put pressure on you like you said where you'd have to pack up because when it gets too intense and you're doing that stress test and the public an sp comes or something gets out of hand you guys had to are trained right how to quickly pack up and get the fuck out of there 
Yeah, so we only ever had to do that once with the John oh. Sweeney thing. There was no other time where we it got to that point where we packed up and went away. Um, we just kind of were all trained in how to deal with that. And we were all kind of, I was ready to have those conversations and and loved it when someone asked me about Xenu and all these alien stories and stuff. Because how would you I was handle like, it? Well, my go-to thing was like, look, I work for the church. I've never seen anything about this. And I know the story because I, you know, watched the Panorama documentary and I've heard of it, but mm -hmm. I work for the church. I would know. And there isn't anything in there that says anything about aliens or whatever. And I was a bit disappointed when I was joined because I thought that would be quite cool as a teenager to join a religion that believes in aliens. Oh, and But no, it's not. And I was just kind of very, like I said just then, in that kind of tone of like, look, yeah. it's not anything like that. Um, and, you, you know, you just trained in how to have conversations in such a way that you satisfy their question so that they get the an they don't get the answer they want, but they feel like they don't have any more questions. Um, so, yeah, I was faced with that question daily um, and was completely happy to answer it, even though I knew I was probably lying through my teeth. But, you know, I didn't get to that level of OT3. Right. So I didn't I didn't actually see those documents because I hadn't got there yet. So I wasn't lying. It's not like yeah. I'd seen the, yeah. the the material and was lying, but I was kind of aware that there are rumours that that exists and, you know, wouldn't be surprised if they did. But as far as I was aware, I hadn't seen anything like that. That's a great point. We're back to what we were talking about earlier. Only 5% make it up to those OT levels. So most Scientologists are not bullshitting when they hear that Xenu thing. That's why I say to people, if you're protesting and you scream Xenu, it's not penetrating at all, except to that small percentage of people. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You know, I um I was asked that question when I was on I had finished OT3. South Park came out in 2005-ish. This was right after I finished, either was on or finished the level. And I had a gal um in my acting class ask me in front of all my mates, some of which were Scientologists and some weren't. <clears throat> and we were trained, you know, hey, is the Xenu story true? Um, do you guys believe in aliens, this and that? Now, unlike you, I had to I had to know that I was lying to her knowingly. And what what we were taught is, you know, it's going to give the person pneumonia. If you tell your your mates that are not Scientologists or even Scientologists that aren't ready for it, I felt like, you know, we were going to kill them. That's what we're told. So I was I was lying for the greater good. I hate that fucking word nowadays, by the way. Anytime someone yeah. says, just do it for the greater good, I'm like, no, that's a that's a cult uh uh point usually. But yeah, and, and in your case, you were honestly, convincingly with your TRs in and with confidence saying, that's bullshit. And if you say it that way, you know, uh, as they teach you in Scientology to have that confidence, you can almost mm -hmm. blow anybody's objections out of the water and they'll be like, oh, yeah, OK. But now now what about the lectures and the general material around the org, the tapes? Hubbard talks about past lives and space opera. Did you have any kind of brush uh like I said, either listening to tapes, perhaps choruses, or even hearing it in and around your mates that are Scientologists. Did the space opera shit come into your universe at all? Or did you genuinely believe, hey, I haven't gotten to the alien shit. I don't know what the hell you're talking about. Yeah, not at all. I mean, London Org is a class five org, so we can take people to, to clear um and then mm -hmm. we don't deliver the ot levels because right. that's done at the advanced doors like saint hill so right. we didn't really have any much of that material at all because we we couldn't deliver those levels there were people who were ot but like you say when you get to that level you're fully indoctrinated to believe that if you tell someone they will get pneumonia and die and so you do your very best to deny that story because you don't want to kill people by telling them. So there were people who obviously knew that story, but there wasn't really any material that I was exposed to or much chatter about it um, at all. You know, it was very really? much about doing TRs, doing auditing, delivering it and right. getting people up the bridge to the state of clear, which is when you get rid of your reactive mind and you think rationally and logically um, and everyone's just happier and, and, you know, goes about their life in a more analytical way i suppose that was kind of what we were focused to do um but yeah it's interesting what you're saying about the conviction because i came into it having seen the bbc panorama documentary right and seeing how forceful people like tommy davis were and saying no this is absolutely not the case we do not believe this and being really forceful with it and thinking that doesn't really present the best image because if it's genuinely not true, why are they so passionate about denying it? You know, why don't they just laugh it off? So when mm -hmm. I was telling people that it's not true, 
you know we would and, and other people in london we kind of almost laugh it off we'd be like no it's absolutely you know don't yeah. be ridiculous it's not the exactly. case and that's what i was saying about london earlier trying to be you know a bit more human and a bit more kind of you know chilled out about it because i think in london if people were as you know can you know convinced and really kind of dedicated to what they're saying about no this is absolutely not the case you instantly think something's there's more to the story here so we were just more chilled about it by going like no we've heard the story a million times right it's not true unfortunately sorry that's not what you want to hear but it's it's not (laughs) yeah and you can say with that kind of conviction until you're like me and you actually get on that level miss j um when doing ot3 did you discuss it with your parents or was it a wink, wink, nudge, nudge, that's funny. Parishioners are not, me and my dad and parishioners in general are not allowed to talk about the confidential levels at all. So me and my dad would wink, wink at each other. And I got to tell you, there was one time when I was in the org and there's a story on OT3 about a cherub that comes out. Oh, I should probably, uh, I wish I would have bookmarked the actual material. I have all the confidential levels on the videos, guys, in the Raising a Secret Society series. I found them online and put a, just put it all out there. But there's one of them that talks about how this, there's incident one and incident two in OT3. And one of them is a cherub comes out, goes left, goes right, and blows a horn. And me and one of the gals that was a Sea Org member at the AOLA in Los Angeles, where you deliver the OT levels, we were going through some religious text or something, and there was the word cherub in there. And we both looked at each other like, yeah, we were both OTs. We can't talk about it or you get fined $100,000, which is what you have to sign. By the way, obviously, that's not legally binding, but I believe that. So I couldn't talk about it with my dad. I couldn't talk about it with anybody. But man, did we, I feel fucking special. A big part of why I got into it, Alexander, looking back, is to get my parents' love and to be at my, the level that my dad was on all these years later when I was just you know, a lazy Wog sitting on the television, not into Scientology while my dad was next door doing OT3. And then in my 30s, I finally get onto it. I thought my parents would be like really proud of me. That was a, a main, a, a main motivation for doing it, looking back at it now. And by the way, I really believed in it because I, you know, they lead you up there, as you know, Alexander. You don't just believe in it, you know, one day. I did thousands of hours of listening to L. Ron Hubbard's space opera lectures. My dad had a library that had every goddamn book and every lecture, yet everything. So I would just spend every day, once I got into this, I spent every day just downloading this into my mind. So when I got up to OT3, it wasn't unusual at all. It was just more of the same from the tape lectures. I was a little disappointed, but it all made sense to me. You know, you don't question, um, you know, all the math that's wrong on it and how Earth has been here for gazillions of years or whatever. You know, my critical thinking was just shut down. But man, did I feel special, Miss J, when me and my dad were able to wink, wink at each other. Were you? Were you? But also, to- they they strip away your ability to question it because exactly in Great the real point. world, if if someone tells you a crazy story about something that happened to them and you don't believe it, you are able to ask other people. You're able to talk about it and try and figure out how it could be true and make your own mind up. But because you're not allowed to talk about it to anyone else, right. you don't, they take right. away the ability to Great think point. critically and to question it and make your own mind up. So you're given Great this point. information and you think, God, this is insane. This guy clearly is on drugs and doesn't know what he's talking about. He's made it all up. But you can't talk to anyone about it to question it. So you're kind of just left to figure out in your own mind how it could possibly tr- be true and find a way yourself to believe it because if you do question it then you know people go oh well obviously you've misunderstood something or you know you're connected to a suppressive person right you know so you you don't do that because you don't want the repercussions um and so you're just trying to figure out in your mind how that how it could be true and you almost brainwash yourself to some extent right 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 such a great point you bring up man because people ask they don't see the mechanisms that are at work we're not all in on a, on a conspiracy. We're not all keeping a secret, but secretly we're all dying inside, but we're not allowed to talk to each other because he says you can never share your case. Your case, by the way, guys, is what your auditor writes down. Every time you go into a session, they write everything down and you're not allowed to talk about your case with your friends or anybody, but the case supervisor. 
It's a very clever mechanism to keep parishioners from talking amongst each other where they would have shared doubts, but we don't. So we're all kind of doubting. And if we have a, a, a like, you know, you know, what's so insidious about it, Alexander, me, my family was relatively okay. Um, like a normal family. And then I describe it like Hubbard, a third party squeezing himself into our family that now dictates what we all need to do. And I thought I was handling my problems. But I got closer to my auditor and closer to Scientology than I did my own family. I, could, I you know, I, I trusted my auditor to tell him things that I couldn't tell my parents. My dad would tell, you know, he, he to this to this day I don't know what his ruin is, but he would you know he's allowed to talk it out with Scientology. My mom never found out what his ruin is, as far as I know, and yet and my parents don't know a bunch about me that I'm telling the church. So we're all kind of like going to the church, our family, to talk about our deepest darkest secrets. But it, but that is separating us more and more because we can talk less and less amongst the fucking family. So what we're disclosing in Scientology, we can't even talk amongst our family. And like I said before, this whole mind fuck came in. And this parasite, we just talked amongst each other. And so it kind of creates secrets. It creates um, a paranoid mindset. And we it was all under the guise, as you know, of protecting your case. You don't want to, it made sense to me, right, Alexander? You don't want to be talking to other people and have verbal tech and have other ideas. You want to keep it between you, Elron Harvard, and your case supervisor. So the trap, it's a trap, but it makes sense the way they explain it. And also, I was listening to your interview with Shelton, where you talked about how do you explain away? This is another thing that people ask. He's a fucking science fiction writer. Why do you guys believe that? Yeah, guys, but we have policies that already explain this and dead agent this. That's what they call it to ourselves and to the public. He made his money to finance and research Scientology through his science fiction. You pointed out in the Shelton interview, that's a separate thing. We know as Scientologists, he, that was just what he used to fund it. This is all bullshit, by the way, guys. I mean, he had like rich parents and he didn't make it all, you know, from his science fiction writing. But he had a policy letter where he says, um, you know, the science fiction is separate from the tech. And we obviously know know that. We know he's a science fiction writer. He makes it very clear that those two are separate. And um, I just thought it was a really good point you made because people ask, you know, why, why, why? But everything is justified as to why you don't talk about your case, you know, why you don't talk about OT3 to other people, etc. It's very clever, though, man, the way he does that, because it all makes sense, right, with the policies. That's the thing is, is everything they teach you and everything you learn, they don't just give it to you all in one big go. Like, it's not like you walk in and you go, like, if you're to walk into a Christian church and say, what are your beliefs? You get the Bible and you right. know, that is literally everything. And you interpret that the way you want to, but this is the book with everything in it. Whereas in Scientology, they don't, you don't walk in and they go, here's the Xenu story about galactic warlords and so on, because right. people would just walk out and go, you're of course they were. insane. So it's all about drip feeding you with information that you can agree with that makes sense to you. And the further in you go, the more indoctrination you do, the more you then become susceptible to agree with that. And things you're talking about the family and, and driving a wedge between your family, mm -hmm. it, you know, they make it make sense in your mind because you get to the point of believing in, you know, past lives and future right. lives and reincarnation. And so the whole family thing is you, you're made to think that it's not very important because you know, yes, this is your parents now or your brother now or your family now, right. but they weren't your family last life and they won't right. be your family next life. That's just for this life. So That's ultimately, it doesn't really matter if you have to disconnect from your family. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, that's just one lifetime and you've lived millions before and you'll live millions after. Ah, so who cares? Right. And it sounds insane saying that when you're outside of Scientology and it's mad that people are, get to the point of believing that. And it is very sad that that is the case. But but it is what happens. And in your mind at that point in time, you think that that is correct. And you think, well, yeah, that makes sense. You know, so who cares if if I don't share my secrets with my family and I share them with the church instead because yeah. they're only my family now and you're so you're in your mindset you genuinely believe that you don't think it's sad you don't notice at the time that this relationship has been completely changed right exactly you have, you describe it really well and like somebody else said it's it's drip 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 boiling a frog in water and that's it's so insidious about it bro like I have a video up guys by the way um 
uh, called, what is it called? Over the Rainbow. It's a Scientology documentary, a rarely seen one that takes you inside the mind of a Scientologist. <clears throat> and there's this really disturbing, oh my God, you just triggered a bunch of shit, bro. I remember we were talking Sorry. before this. No, no. You always say that, but it's Alexander. I like this because you're healing me, man. It's like you're bringing out stuff that I didn't even know was there. We were talking, by the way, guys, you know, about Christmas and stuff. And it just, he just reminded me, geez, I haven't seen my fucking family, you know, for holidays forever. And it's just all so sad. And it's all based around what he's just talking about right now, man. How back, you know, on that documentary, there's a gal who's trying to leave Scientology or, you know, just wants to be herself and live her own life. And her father's a hardcore Sea Org member, Scientologist. And they had this phone conversation where he's just adamant about, no matter what you say, you need to go into ethics and this and that. She's like, dad, I'm not a Scientologist, blah, blah, blah. And it's just, he just said, well, you know, we're just, we're, we're doing a little father daughter game this lifetime around. It's just a role we're playing. So yeah, you can go ahead and go your separate way. You know, the consequences of that, you're going to be declared an SP and I'm going to go ahead and go my way. And she's pleading with him, dad, please, man, can't you see what's going on? But once they have your eternity, once they convince you that this technology is the only way for your salvation, not just in this lifetime, what we're going for, guys, is to remember um, our whole track, all of our past lives, so that future incarnations from here on out will be pleasant. And we can select using our free will and having our memory intact where we want to go next lifetime. We can select another Scientology body. We can walk through walls. We can read people's minds. We have superpowers. Now, if that's true and you believe that and they convince you through the drip drip of brainwashing, wouldn't you give up anything to keep that? Hey, this is just one lifetime, bro. I'm going for my eternity. And he tells you you have one shot right here, right now. Don't fuck it up. If you miss the tech this lifetime, you get sucked into the wog world. You'll buy into some bullshit religion, whatever. Your salvation will never happen. This is the science of memory so that you can take with you. Why do we incarnate? We fucking have forget. Why does, you know, there are stories, by the way, of kids, you know, apparently remembering shit from past lives or whatever. But if you believe in that, that's few and far between. So Aaron Hubbard says, why do we forget this and that? Once you start buying into this, your future becomes super important. This lifetime loses its, its importance because it's all about a grander goal than just your freaking family and, and your, you know, your kids and stuff. This is Alexander, that conversation that, that I'm talking about in that video. I've had that with my father pleading with them so many times. Like I was like starving for a lot of times. I just, I just needed five bucks to get some fucking food to, you know, survive. I remember yeah. calling my dad up, asking him, I think if he could wire like 10 bucks or something, like literally just, it was just so dramatic getting out of this and trying to put my life together. And I lost everything, including going homeless. And my dad said over the phone, just expand your anchor points, son, put them out. Get some distance. In other words, it was completely irrelevant to dad. I'm on Hollywood Boulevard starving and I'm, I'm with the drunks and the, you know, the homeless people. And I don't know how to get out of this. and I'm losing my mind. I think Scientology fucked me up. And he just very calmly said, expand your anchor points. Doug was doing an OT drill on me. This is the level of lunacy and the, the desensitate, it desensitizes you from everything. It, it suddenly all becomes about the goal, the purpose of Hubbard and your family is just bullshit. Did, did, and they guilt trip you as well. Because, absolutely. Because there's this mindset of you being the spiritual being and having cause over life and you mm -hmm. create everything in your universe yeah. in front of you. You're responsible for everything. Um, because of that, if something gets in the way, you know, like you have to disconnect from your family or something, they guilt trip you and they go, look, hold on. You believe there are bigger things in life. There's more important things. We, we're trying to clear the planet and save humanity here. So are you really going to let your SP son or this person get in the way? You know, are you, do you really think that, you know, you might not have any food or you might be homeless or whatever, but are you going to let that get in the way of helping humankind? Right. That's a, that's a minuscule problem. There's nothing right. Yeah. It sucks, but it doesn't mean anything because you are more powerful than that. and You can do better. And, you know, it, it's a guilt trip thing and it makes, yeah. it makes you kind of think, okay well yeah maybe that is right maybe that is the right thing to do maybe i can do better and maybe i do need to have a better attitude to get myself out of the situation that doesn't change the fact you're homeless and don't have any food right yeah, exactly. it just makes you fall into it more and think scientology is the way to get myself out of this shit situation 
And you're responsible for your condition. So anything that was happening in my life, according to my dad, I pulled it in. And they always tell you, when you leave Scientology, you're going to be working at McDonald's for the rest of your life. You're going to be homeless. Everything else is going to be lesser. And you know what, guys? L. Ron Hubbard knew, like any cult leader, that that is going to happen to you probably because they install so many phobias in your mind, especially if you've been, been in for a long time. They do a real number on your mind that you're probably going to crack and go through PTSD when you do come out. So it's very common for someone's life to break down and fall apart before they then have to rebuild it back up. So I was acting out exactly what I was told was going to happen, not because I believe in the tech or because they were right, but because they terrified me of the outside world and because of the phobia installation. And slowly as I undid that, I come back. But from my parents' perspective, I'm just doing exactly what they knew would happen. I'm an SP. My life is crashing. Hey, Doug, you had a great acting career. Now you're homeless. When are you going to come back to Scientology? Come come on, kitty, kitty. You were on OT3. They, Why would you throw that all away, Doug? Yeah. They also make it really hard once you come out to have yes. a normal life because yes. the things you're taught in Scientology um, run so deep in the way your brain thinks. Yes. You know, you come out, you come out of Scientology thinking – people act in the way they do because of X, Y, Z, right? One key example I, I've talked about before with other people is the, the tone scale. So in Scientology, there's a belief that if you're happy or sad or whatever emotion you're feeling, um, they teach that it's a linear scale. So you don't just go from being angry to being happy. There's a process to get there. And it's a very um, sort of mathematical. You go through this step to this step to this step to then feel this emotion. Now, it kind of, you know, I can understand how that would sort of make sense and might be an, an, a way to look at people's emotions and that sort of thing. But emotions are not black and white. It's not numbered it's not a, you don't go from one to the other in that order it's not the way it actually is but that's how you're taught that people behave and feel um and that's what will happen so you get taught you know if you're having an argument with someone about something and they're very clearly upset or angry with you you know i noticed this um after leaving my mind goes to a place of not thinking hold on this person's upset about something let's talk about that and resolve the issue my mind went to a place of this person's feeling this emotion. I need to get them to feel a different emotion on the tone scale so that then we can rationally talk about it and figure out the issue and resolve it. But we're not going to be able to resolve it until they're a different point on the tone scale. And because that's the way you believe people behave and the way they feel emotions, you're, you're manipulating the conversation in a, a way you're not aware of. But that makes it really hard when you get out of Scientology because when someone's angry, you say you work at McDonald's after leaving and you get an angry customer, the way you're going to deal with that is going to be completely opposite to anyone who's not right. been in Scientology. And that difference alone is really hard to combat. So yeah, they make you scared of leaving. But when you do leave, actually you realize you're thinking in a completely different way to everybody else on the planet because you've been taught you know, the way your brain works has been wired to think differently and to think this person is like this because of this teaching, for example. Yeah, this is the tone scale. This is so evil, by the way, guys. This is something that we're drilled on. We have to sit up against a wall and we have to embed all these different um, various tones into our brain. And by the way, this and the is goal is to be tone 40, right? Right. If and that is what is, you know what tone 40 is? It's serenity of beingness. It's, it's sort of the yeah. Buddha, right? So this is the goal in Scientology to get to raise your tone on the tone scale. And by the way, while we're on this thing, because it's very interesting, since we believe in past lives as Scientologists, it actually goes below body death. Body death is right here at 0, 0.0. So there's all these different tone levels. This guy was out of his fucking mind. Below body death, controlling bodies, protecting bodies, owning bodies. And then, um, but we mostly deal with this um, body death upwards. And the one that you don't want to be, which I am considered, and um, Alex would be considered, is covertly hostile, 1-1. One, one. This is the worst one. This is where they say gays are at. They're, um, in other words, they're, they got a knife uh, hiding behind their back. This is anybody that leaves Scientology too. And, um, and then we have another famous, isn't there postulates on here somewhere, uh, Alex? Isn't that another? Yeah, one? this up there 30, somewhere. It's a bit 30. blurry on my screen, but I think it's like 30 or I know, it's too blurry. It's the one yeah. right below, but postulates. It's, it's a 30, yeah, from, from memory. But 
um and yeah thing- i mean it's it's mad and they would use mm-hmm. this right so i left the chat i was kicked out and declared a source of trouble and you know I haven't, I left eight years ago, I haven't spoken out publicly about Scientology until the last couple of months. And so for people still in the church who are looking at this or hear about this, they would use that as evidence. They would go, see, Alex was in Scientology and he was a bit upset at the time about being kicked right. out. However, now he's talking out publicly against Scientology yeah. and therefore he's gone down on the tone scale. So see, yes. isn't that bad? With Scientology, he was higher on the tone scale, even though he was upset, right. now covert hostility. So he's, he's gone down in life and right. he's not happy with his life because right. he's talking bad, you know, negatively about us. And it's just mad to think that they use that as justification and they probably will be sitting there in the org thinking, oh, look how, how bad Alex is doing with his life. You know, I've got more money. I've got more friends. I'm happier in life than I was back then, right? And it's the complete opposite. But they will look at my actions as a sign of being at this point on this tone scale, which is complete exactly. bollocks in itself. <laughs> I know. But once you believe into that, everything else that goes along with it. Also on this tone scale, if you're... Let's say somebody's at anger, which is, I know nobody can really see this. I can't really blow it up anymore, but anger is um, 1.5. So the way that they teach you to talk to somebody at anger is not just to have a normal organic conversation and maybe yell back at the guy or, hey, dude, calm down. They tell you to go 0.5 higher on the tone scale and meet him at that. So if somebody's, if I was angry at my dad, he would go up to being antagonistic, which is 0.5 higher, 2.0. So in his whole brain, it's running like a computer where he's not having a conversation with me. He's just acting antagonistic because I'm acting angry. And the theory in Scientology by doing that is you'll bring somebody up the tone scale. I'm going to do a video on this, too, at some point, Alexander, because the tone scale is one of the most manipulative, evil ways to manipulate another person, shut down your heart and interact with people via this complete pseudoscience bullshit thing called the tone scale. Were you using that that thing uh, when you were selling books? Were you trying? Were you trained to meet the antagonistic public, uh, or an angry public and antagonism? How how good were you at jumping on that tone scale? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, we would come back and tell stories of like how this guy who was walking past us was shouting, "Oh, you Scientologists! You know, you're in a cult right. and being angry." And I managed to talk. To Talk to them and change them on the tone scale so to the point where they did a stress test and bought the book, right? And we would we would use that as a success story and say, like, look, this this is the tone scale in action. This guy was antagonistic or this guy was hostile, and he ended up walking away feeling like he's got the solution to his problem in life, which is the book of Dianetics. And that's because I applied the tone scale. And you know, obviously it's just good sales tactics, but it, you know, it's not emotions don't work in that linear numbered fashion. No, they um, don't. And when you're in Scientology, because everyone else believes it and you're following this this formula of communication, you know, you kind of go along with it and you're you made to believe it. But when you come out and you realize that not everyone thinks the same, if someone's being angry towards you and you'll be antagonistic back. That's not going to genuinely make that person no, it's feel not. any better about you. It's, it's just going to persist the conversation, right? Of course, of course. But man, I really believed in that. And like I said, I spent, you know, I had to do the PTSSP course, which is where that tone scale is introduced amongst other courses. I had to do that three times. So once I believed in that, once I believed in Hubbard, I believed in everything else. And that tone scale, like you said, it's stupid that you're going to meet somebody, you know, and that's going to do anything. And also, there's no breaking people out of this. I remember trying to tell my dad, just, God damn it, can't you just, like, see beyond the programming and see what's really happening here? But once those tools are in your mind, they're, they, you, you know that you got a special tech and those things are right. There is a moment in the BBC Panorama doc. I should have told you about this beforehand so you could get the clip up in time. But mm-hmm. there's a moment in BBC Panorama which I genuinely think is, like, an iconic TV moment that – has been missed right and i think it's a real um just a three second clip that like shows exactly where someone's mind is at in scientology and it's where john sweeney um sits down and asks ann archer you know there's lots of people that say 
Scientologists is a brain Scientology is a right. brainwashing cult. And she like takes a second and she like folds her arm and she goes, right. Do I look brainwashed to you? Right. right. And I was like, wow, like offended. She was angry. Yeah. But she was putting the question back to him and saying, Look, I'm not, I've heard this before. I've heard people say, do you think I look brain like I'm offended that you even asked me that question, right? And I think it's an iconic piece of TV because it just so perfectly encapsulates that mindset that they are so brainwashed because not only do they not see it and realize it, but they're offended that someone thinks that that's what's happened to them. And that's how deep it goes in your mind. And I think we've talked about this before, Doug, of like, you know, it's similar to like Alcoholics Anonymous, right? If someone has a drug problem or an alcohol problem, you know, you can't help someone that doesn't want help, right? And so once you've made the decision, you're not 100% in agreement with Scientology, then it's a lot easier to help that person get out. And things like the Aftermath Foundation exists to really help people in that situation that are trying to get out. But it's really hard to convince someone that they're brainwashed or help, convince someone that they need help to get out of this thing when yeah. they genuinely believe that, that this is the best thing in, in the world. They, you know, when I was in Scientology, people would come and say to me, you're brainwashed, you're, you know, you need help. Do you need help getting out of this? Did and they say like, that to you, Alexander? Did all you, did the time, come up? yeah. Really? Like facing. What I was your response? Time, what was your so response look, and what was your feeling when they'd say that? I would be like, look, there is no one chaining me up anywhere i come into work voluntarily every day i leave every day no one's going to come and hunt me down if i leave like i'm not here because i have to be i'm here because i want to be and if i wanted to leave that's absolutely fine like i'm here because i want to be so no i'm i don't need help i don't if i wanted to come out i would right and so just your mind is just if I didn't want to be here, I wouldn't be. I'm doing yeah. something good. I'm enjoying my time here. Yeah. Why would I want to stop, right? It sounds so reasonable when you say that because I'm putting myself back and when I was in Scientology mode, nobody's making me go here. What do you mean brainwashed? And by the way, I didn't know, like I think the majority of the population, unless you're a psychologist, you study it, maybe you're in a cult, you learn about it afterwards. I didn't know what the fuck brainwashing was. I just knew that I wasn't brainwashed because my understanding of it is, um, I don't know, someone swung a watch in front of me, they hypnotized me, they put me under, they have a gun to my head, they're making me go, but on my own free will, I know what I'm doing. What do you mean I've been brainwashed? It's so fascinating to find out what brainwashing means and then see that that's exactly what happened to me. But you can never tell anybody. You can't use facts, critical thinking, because it's been shut down, or logic, or tone 40 intention and telling somebody you're brainwashed, come to present time, snap out of it. It doesn't work, not least because Ann Archer, that, that clip that you're talking about, I know exactly what you're talking about. I just tried to find it and pull it up, but I couldn't find it. Yeah. She Sorry, I should really have mentioned believed, it before, so you get it. Oh, it's fine, man. It's fine. If we do another interview too, man, we'll, we'll bring up yeah. some, some clips and stuff because we're, we were just getting into it. Um, but yeah, I know exactly how Ann Archer felt. And she got really offended too. And again, she made the same points that I'd say when people would say, Doug, you're brainwashed. I'm like, what do you mean? I'm doing it by my own free will. If somebody could have explained what that meant or broken out Steve Hassan's book and said, this is what we mean. If I could have seen what the fuck brainwashing was, perhaps that would have worked. But then again, they're never going to I'm going to shoo them away before they even break open the book because I know I'm not brainwashed. And that's the thing in, in Scientology and in Dianetics, you know, Elron Hubbard talks about, I think it's in Dianetics, he talks about brainwashing. He says, and he makes right. you believe brainwashing is, right. you know, hypnotism with dangling a watch in front of you and, you know, making you feel like you, do, you know, you don't have control over your situation. And Scientology and Dianetics is not that because you have mm -hmm. complete control. And what we're trying to do is give you by yourself and therefore you're not yeah. brainwashed because that, yeah. you know, no one's tying you up and putting a gun to your head. Um, but actually, it, it is brainwashing because people think of it as that, but it's not. Um, I didn't realize the extent to which the damage was done in my brain. You know, I've been out for eight years. It's only really in the last year um, that I've been working on how much, you know, before I realized how much it's affected me in my brain. And this idea of, you know, the tone scale and having an argument with someone. And, you know, that was the big, big telltale for me is how deep this goes. Yeah. When I when I was confronted with this person who was upset with me, my mind 
I didn't care really what that person was saying to me. I just wanted to manipulate their emotions so that they were feeling a different way so yes. that then we could talk about it. And when I realized I was doing that subconsciously, that's when I realized, hold on, this stuff goes deeper than I realized because I, that was a year ago. I didn't believe in Scientology. I hadn't been in an org for eight years, seven mm -hmm. years at that point. And so I wasn't thinking I'm applying Scientology here. I was just doing that. And when I realized that that's what I was doing, I was like, holy shit, this is, that's what brainwashing is. It's right. programmed me to think and behave and act in a certain way. And I wasn't even aware of it. Exactly. I don't think most people are Alexander and we don't need to beat ourselves up for that. I certainly wasn't taught this in school. I, I definitely feel cult proof now. I've recognized the signs somebody pointed out earlier. That it's just like being in an abusive relationship with a narcissist. Exactly. You got the love bombing, the brainwashing, the manipulation, and then the CPTSD when you come out of a relationship with a narcissist that you've been married to or whatever for 20 years. So yeah, but minus not knowing this, no one was ever going to convince me that I was brainwashed. That's just, that's just the worst thing you could say to somebody because you're just going to actually push them more into the bubble. As an amateur, I told my parents constantly, you're brainwashed, snap out of it, you're whatever, sheeple. Being mean to people doesn't work. Caring about them, dropping seeds, and also letting them work, work it out on their own because I think people can wake up and be quote unquote saved when they're ready on their own clock. And it's not up to me to play God and beat my parents out of it either. So it's a fine line to walk. We want to rescue our, our fellow people that are brainwashed, but it's, it can be, I'm no expert. Um, and I know what Steve Hassan says about dropping seeds, about caring, about asking penetrating questions without, yeah. you know, hindering their reality too much, but you have to ask questions. Well, what about L. Ron Hubbard? Well, what, what about when he said here, the problem with that though, I can't even talk to my freaking parents. Like once you lose the ability, once you're declared an SP and you're looked at like that, you can't even have a conversation with someone to initiate the process. This is why sometimes people will leave, go under the radar in Scientology, hold on to their family and pretend to be Scientologists while they're in a position to then drop seeds. But as soon as you do something like me and you get your, you know, SP'd and your parents think that you're Satan reincarnate. I can't have a conversation with them about this. And the few times that I had, I even emailed them the, uh, I showed them the bite model live and then I emailed it to them and I broke them down. I said, look, here's what Scientology does on this point of the bite model. Here's how they control our behavior. Here's how Hubbard did the thought control, or whatever. Once those programs get there first, it's like a filter that no, no information, no critical thinking, no being mad at them penetrates that program. It's, you know, Hubbard was first and foremost an expert hypnotist. And remember how he said, Alex, how he's unhypnotizing us, how the world's brainwashed, which I agreed with. And he's unbrainwashing. Scientology's not, he dead agents everything first, guys. So the reason we don't go to psychologists, psychiatrists, or think that we're being brainwashed or hypnotized is because he said uh, at the very beginning, uh, man is asleep. He is brainwashed. He is hypnotized. What we do in Scientology is to undo that. We give him the tools to be able to have his mind back. And, you know, in typical cult slash Elrond fashion, everything's an inversion. So we knew he wasn't brainwashing and hypnotizing us, A, because I didn't know what hypnosis was until I learned about it afterwards. I thought, again, it was just swinging a watch in front of your face. It's not. There's other ways to do it. And I, you know, uh, he already told me he's not hypnotizing us. And clearly I'm getting unhypnotized because I'm having these blowout wins in session which were nothing more than guided imagination, um, you know, while in a light trance state and having his ideas implanted into you. And by the way, guys, that's another part that's missing that people don't see in the auditing and the TRs, the training. We are going into a light trance state and it makes you super suggestible, just like watching the television. You might wonder why people do advertisements. Why would they spend millions of dollars on these stupid jingles or whatever? Because it really does work. If you're sitting there on the couch or you're in an auditing session and your, your focus of attention is being held and your imagination is being guided in a certain way and you have to stay within those tram lines and you can only get out when you have a blowout win, when your imagination is guided to such a point where you realize you were Napoleon in a past life or you were... Um, you know, probably not Napoleon wouldn't be a good one. But by the way, in the past lives, everybody's somebody famous. You know, I was never um, a person working, 
you know, a normal job or whatever. I was like, you know, all these different famous people, as are all Scientologists. But once you give over your imagination to this hypnotist, he can make you believe fucking everything and try to undo that or tell my parents, you know. Um, by the way, you know, you, you know what they my parents say to this day, Alexander? It's not that what I was saying was true. And that it was the fact that according, because again, they don't listen to me. They only listen to Scientology. So what the Department of Processing, the DFP, has told them, um, Doug only left because he attested to past life clear. I did my grades, by the way. I did the Purif, blah, blah, blah. I did up to grade four, skipped NED or new aerodynamics. And then I went right on to attesting to past life clear. And then I did the OT levels. And they said, the reason you're getting so fucked up on OT3 and all the OT levels is because you attested to past life clear and you need to go back and do NED, blah, blah, blah. So that is the stable datum in my parents' head. Even when I was out for years and I still had them in my life before I finally had to get rid of them because they'd always try to pull me back. And they're kind of narcissists, as we were talking about earlier. So it's kind of nothing to go back to anyways. They were controlling before Scientology. But they are absolutely convinced to this day. They're just waiting for me to come back, Alexander. They're waiting for me to go through Ned properly. And then they know that everything will be solved. And from my yeah. viewpoint, if they could only understand and see the bigger picture, what they are, are involved in, if they could just pull out of it. It's crazy, it's right? It's the most bold faced lie. The whole talking about it being hypnotism is, you know, it's almost laughable, really, when you're out of it and you can look back at it. It, you know, Elron Hubbard says, We're not hypnotizing you. We're not brainwashing you because what brainwashing is, is making you, you know, suppress your emotions and not, you know, be in touch with your feelings and what you actually think and what you feel. What Scientology does is make empower you to be more aware of what you think and what you feel. And yet the technique, you know, TR zero or TR one, whichever it was, where you like ball baiting, right? So I did ball baiting mm -hmm. when I was in Scientology where you're sat there in front of someone else. And the idea is that that person has to try and get you to react in some way. And by you not reacting and being able to sit there and have anyone shout anything at you and, you know, insult you, whatever that, the teaching is that that makes you so in touch with your emotions and your feelings that you can confront anything and you have control. You know, if someone finds a button, you know, with John Sweeney in that video that we saw earlier, yeah. Tommy Davis found the word bigot. If he uses that word over and mm -hmm. over again, John Repeat. Sweeney will react because he doesn't yeah. like hearing it. Mm -hmm. So ball, that's exactly what ball baiting is. So you're trained in Scientology to do that so that you can be called anything under the sun someone can insult you or hurt you or upset you and you are at cause you don't react and therefore you're in control but actually what it's doing is the opposite it's suppressing emotion it's yeah. it's me like separating you and your mind from your emotions and your feelings and, and th those bits that make you human and that's exactly what L. Ron Hubbard said that's what brainwashing is that's what hypnotism is and that's not what we're doing we're making you more confident and aware of your emotions and yet the process does the opposite and it's just the most bold-faced lie i know leave it but it's because it's so bold-faced that, that's another great point you bring up he was so confident in what he was saying at the very beginning of dianetics it says this is the most important discovery since fire the wheel and whatever else it was so bold and bald-faced he was so confident in saying we finally understand the mind that why wouldn't I believe him? No one's going to say claims like that that are that, you know, out there. That's another part of why it works. He himself was so confident. I kind of saw him as a kid. He was jovial. He was joking and everything. He seemed to very be very flamboyant and just very loose, despite having, you know, the government after him. And he, I, I kind of he seemed like a an OT. He seemed like he. And it, it's just the, the, the bold faced lie. And also there's organizations everywhere. So it can't be a fraud. They're not going to, the government would have shut it down. They have buildings everywhere. Obviously, why would I ever think it's illegal? That's, that's one of the things we talked about all the time. And one of the things that we would say publicly um, as a Div Sixer is if Scientology was really brainwashing people and really tearing people apart and their families and right. forcing people to be disconnected, if it was really as abusive as people say, we wouldn't be here. We would have been shut down because exactly. you believe that the government have, have power and authority and you believe that 
they would stop something as bad as that, don't you? So therefore, we can't be doing that because they haven't shut us down. When actually what's happening is they're fighting tooth and nail. And any time anyone from the government gets anywhere near shutting down Scientology, they fire back with firing thousands of lawsuits at them and snow them under in so much paperwork that the government go, please stop, we'll give you what you want. And that's how they got tax exempt status in the States. You know, they attack, attack, attack until they can't take it anymore. And so it's just such a lie, right? You, we wouldn't be here if we were if we were doing all of that. That makes well, sense, actually, though. I would. I, that's no. what I believe. That's what I yeah. st- would have thought. How on earth, Alexander, were we supposed to know? That was my thinking. If if we're doing all these horrible things that people say we're doing, I'm a Scientologist. I don't see any of this shit going on. Mm-hmm. Obviously, the government would have stepped in. And also, I remember when we got our tax exempt status. I think that was in what was that ninety six? Do I have that date right? Ninety three. I think ninety three. Yeah. I remember my pops, it was like a day of celebration. He was so excited. And it was just more confirmation in my family. I was kind of in and around Scientology, but I hadn't taken to it yet. But I remember that day. My parents were like, we're a religion now. It's been proven. So it's like the government. Well, that's another. I kind of think that's a cult, too. But I'm just saying, I mean, I understand now why the government doesn't take him down. I have a much better understanding of the world. But in my naive state early on, I was like exactly like you. Uh, they're not brainwashing us. None of this shit. You said, we're not, you know, disconnecting families and all this crap. If we were, you know, hypnotizing people, robbing them of their money, their life and their family, then obviously we'd be shut down by the government. That's why it's, you know, fuck them for not shutting them down and for somebody not taking them on. Because every day that passes by that they don't intervene, um, that's more people that are going to be like me and you. They're going to be like, I mean, it's on the street corner out here in L.A., bro. They have them all over the world. They're these big, fancy buildings. They look opulent and expensive. Obviously, if they're just brainwashing people, it would have been shut down a long time ago. So that's on the yeah. government, man, for not taking them out a long and, time ago. And when you ask those questions, like when I went into Scientology, I, you know, I was inquisitive. I was critical thinking. Mm-hmm. I asked these yeah. questions. I would say, like, I've heard about this disconnection thing, right, which tears mm-hmm. families apart. Is that something that you guys do? And they give you answers that satisfy what you your question, right? So they would go, well, look, this person who works at the church, they they disconnected from a friend, right? And ask them, and they they would say, no, that I'm really happy that you know this guy was really mean to me, it was horrible, and so I cut him off and said I don't want to speak to you anymore, and now I'm happier for it. And you go, mm-hmm. okay, well, yeah, maybe the disconnection thing isn't as bad because I don't see anyone walking around the church miserable and upset and grumpy that they don't have a family anymore because they're all happy that they've done it but that's because they've got that person to believe in their own mind that that is the way to solve the problem right and so of course they're going to be walking around being happy because they're the one that's done it and they're the one under the influence of the the mind control to make them believe that that's the best way of dealing with the situation it you know it's it's insane because they show you they give you an answer and they show you see look this person has done it do they look ha- unhappy? Do they look brainwashed? Do they look like they're, you know, under control of someone else's mind? No, they're walking around doing their job. They're happy. They come to work every day. Therefore, they're in control. It's not brainwashing them. And yet here I am eight years later, realizing the way I was communicating with someone isn't listening to them and just manipulating them. And you think, hold on, this is how much deeper does this go? So that's what it's taken a year to to start unpacking that and realizing that it's the little things you don't notice, you know, Chris Shelton, I was speaking to him and he said that he was, he's been out 10 years or something like that now. And even to this day, there are little things here and there that he realizes he has a Scientology influence. And I think once you've been in Scientology, the impact it has on you is, is lifelong. I think in one of your videos, yeah, you, said, yes. you said once I will, never not be an ex-Scientologist. It's part of my history now. Yeah. And it's about unpacking that and and figuring out a new way of, of living and realizing the the impact it's had on you, you know, mm-hmm. all this time later. Yeah, exactly. That's really well said, man, because um I look at it as integrating. I know I don't deny that I'm an ex-Scientologist. I don't deny that experience, but integrating it, I've actually gotten something out of it that it's something more than when I got into it. So in a weird way, by getting my ass kicked and handed to me so hard and by being put deeply under a spell, I learned all about how easy it is. Uh, it, 
to be manipulated. And not only that, Aunt Alexander, it set me on a whole journey down many rabbit holes where I'm grateful because it forced me to increase my education about the mind, about brainwashing. And I found these subjects freaking fascinating. I would have rather just studied that than Scientology. But since I was a guinea pig for their brainwashing machine, it really um, was a forced study and I learned a shitload because of it, but I never want to go through it a second time. And part of my main motivation was understanding it so hard and still to this day is I can't take that a second time, bro. It cost me mm -hmm. too much and it was too brutal, um, but lesson learned, man. Uh, do you, uh, I, you know, would you come on a second time possibly, uh, Alexander, because we, he, by the way, guys, he sent me, he's got a whole, sent me some notes and he has a bunch of very interesting tidbits, which we barely got to cover. Um, and I want to kind of, you know, wrap up his story and then I'll talk about what he's talking about right now, about some tools and some healing. And Hey, what did you do, Alex, to, you know, you just said in the last year you've been starting. So because we've been going for about an hour and a half, I guess we'll, we'll end off with some in a positive note now that we've broken that down in some of your experience. But would you mind coming back possibly a second time so we can go deeper into this? hundred percent. I think we, we've talked yeah. a lot over the last couple of weeks. And I think mm -hmm. we've both got a few ideas of different things we can talk about and things that are interesting. And I think, you know, I'm really interested in, like you were saying, the journey of recovery and education mm -hmm. is really important, but you can't you know, you, you can't tell an alcoholic they're an alcoholic, right? They yeah. have to realize it themselves. And it's the exactly. same with someone who's been in Scientology or any any cult or coercive, coercive group. When you're in it, you can't, you can't change their mind. And I think for people who are watching this that aren't former Scientologists, who haven't been impacted personally, but are just interested and agree that it's something that has a negative impact on a lot of people, mm -hmm. what can you do to help? And it's it's hard because you know, when the anonymous protests were happening and there are people picketing outside, you know, we'd have people come in and shout stuff all the time walking past the org. Um, you know, you're a cult. And there was never like a mass scale protest while I was there, but there were definitely things going on. And if anything, it fueled us more to yeah. try and try harder because we would be like, look how insane these people are, that they think we're doing bad when actually exactly. we're doing good things this just shows how fucked up the world is and yeah. how much they need scientology because they don't even see that we're helping people, right so yes. it's that kind of really attacking way of doing things i think it has its merits but i think ultimately that's not what's going to change uh scientology that's not what that's not going to help people get out i think we need to look at education helping people realize and think for themselves like you mm -hmm. said earlier um the questioning asking people well look what do you think about when lrh said this in one policy and in this policy it's the complete opposite so they're both his words and they complete opposite well what do you think about that you know those sorts of questions get a scientology member or any co person in a coercive group to start thinking for themselves and that sort right. of starts to open up the hatch and get people go down going down that rabbit hole of of realizing what they're into so i think yeah it's just it's how do we start doing things like that and i think that's really that's a whole other topic for another day but i think that's where the focus needs to be is education and and that absolutely and that's part of what i want to talk to you about in interview number two because like i said guys he, he was kind enough to send over some notes and we want to deep dive into the solutions part and then also there's more parts of his story to tell that we didn't get to that we'll incorporate into that. But I, I feel like we laid out your basic story. And also, guys, I'm going to leave a link to the interview that he did with Chris Shelton because I didn't want him to just repeat a story on this channel. We went a little deeper into some, dude, this was really amazing, some of the stuff you brought up. I love the way you talk, man, because you're getting, you have new thoughts and ideas that I haven't thought about. And we just scratched Because I've got my TRs in. I'm OT. <laughs> <laughs> it must be that, or, or yeah, or you, or you seem to have really thought about this and broke it down. So I just wanted to let you guys, first of all, thanks for coming back on a second time because we have a lot more to talk about, guys, and we're not done yet. I just wanted to kind of move into wrap it up mode because I think we hit on his basic story. Like I said, I'll leave the link where for two hours he talks to Chris Shelton. You can get his basic story so we don't have to just repeat everything. So I want to go with the way we're going in this interview uh, even more on the next one because of the notes that you left me. And also, we talk a lot about the problem. So, you know, what's the solution? As we head out here on this one, could you tell me briefly, though, what your process was coming out? 
So we'll pick it. So you get booted out a second time on staff. What kind of was your process and why did it take you X amount of years to get up to the point where just in the last year, you've really been getting serious about breaking that down. Everybody's journey out is different. How did it kind of go for you? I mean, I was kicked out and I was, so I, I was really messed up and annoyed that I got kicked out the first time. Right. Mm -hmm. And so when I was on the staff and upset about it, I kind of said, look, I'm upset. I'm annoyed that I got kicked out. And, Mm -hmm. you know, they gave me some auditing and there were some actions that we did that, excuse me, that were trying to kind of resolve that. And I kind of ended up saying, well, look, I've done this auditing session and we've tried to handle this upset. Um, but I'm I'm not upset about it. I went into an auditing session and I came out feeling worse. And I was like, look, I believe Scientology works and it helps people. I've seen it help people. It's not helping me. I want to get to the point where it is helping me. And that was enough in their mind to say that I think Scientology doesn't work and blah, blah, blah. And I got declared what's called a source of trouble type D which I talk a lot more about in in Chris Shelton's interview. We actually go through the policy letter, but it's basically where um, they say I was a responsible for case, meaning I was putting Scientology as the reason for my upsets in life, which is kind of true because I was kicked out by Scientology. It upset me, but they basically use that as a reason to kick me out. And so I initially was really pissed off and annoyed and went through the motions over the years of like, you know, trying to get back in good grace. And I had a return program if I have to do this course and this oh, course God. and so on to try and get back in. And over the years, kind of, because I wasn't in that environment every day, hanging around with Scientologists all day, every day, you kind of, you're, you, you start to lose the indoctrination. Mm-hmm. So over the time, I kind of got to the point of like, well, look, I'm living my life. I went back to university and had a really good, you know, few years there being, a, you know, being a kid and having fun and growing up and, right, you know, right. getting a job and finding my own life. And that was really good and really fun and just kind of separated myself from it. Um, but it was only in the last year or so that I realized that, um, you know, it's still affecting me in some way. And I started watching videos that yourself and Chris Shelton and Aaron Smith Levin have done. And just, you know, I picked up Mike Grinder's book recently, which I just started watching, uh, reading, sorry. And just sort of started to think, hold on, maybe this is something that's affecting me more than I realize. And then started unpacking it and seeing a therapist and, you know, talking through these things and figuring out hold on, I'm not as in touch with my emotions as perhaps I should be, or hold on, here's this the argument example I gave of I'm manipulating someone. I don't like the fact I do that. And, right. you know, just realizing ways I was doing things and questioning them. Um, and then, yeah, just over the space of the year, working with a, a therapist to try and figure these things out. And the therapist I see is a, an expert in coercive control groups. And one of the things they do is get me to do like different tasks and one really good thing that we've talked about before that worked really well was mapping out things i agree with in scientology and things i don't agree with and doing like a venn diagram right think about everything i know about scientology and their teachings and their beliefs thank you by the way educo educon um yeah but just he was a member he he was a member by the way of um the educo cult is that is that right oh yeah 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 Yeah. he's out there fighting a good fight too man God bless but yeah, that. just like mapping out in my head to try and figure out, okay, what what is me? What do I believe? What do I think? And what is what has been taught to me by Scientology? And just doing that process of mapping it out, writing it out, helps you see it in front That's of you. That's fantastic. Right. And that has really helped me un- sort of unlock the door and start going down that that route and, and you know, accepting it and uh, figuring uh, it out. That's a great tool. How exactly did your psychologist, your cult expert, get you to do that? Would you get triggered in the day and then have a belief and then write it down? Oh, is that Scientology? Is it me? Or did you literally sit down um, and just go over? How, how exactly did you go down to create this list yeah. and stuff? What was the process? I kind of, I realized that uh, there were so many different things that I wasn't sure about that I was doing that Mm -hmm. is what Scientology teaches. And I was thinking certain ways and I kind of got a bit confused about who, who am I, what's my belief and what Scientology. I wasn't really sure. And so part of the, the the task was to try and, okay, let's figure out who is you, who are you, what do you think and what, 
is a hangover from Scientology. So I just sat down one day and just spent a couple of hours writing down every little thing that I remember from Scientology, you know, whether it be a policy or a belief or, you know, the tone scale might be one thing or, um, you know, the reactive mind is another and all these little things, big concepts right down to actual policies and techniques and just wrote them all down and then thought about every single one and just thought, okay, do I believe this? Do I agree with it? Do I not? And then after I'd done it, seeing very clearly the good bits and the bits that maybe were there before being in Scientology and some of the bits that I maybe have picked up from Scientology, but aren't doing any harm and that's okay. And that in itself, just mapping it out and just thinking about it helped me realize who I am a lot more and therefore what bits of Scientology have impacted me negatively. And then it's easier to then confront that and get rid of it. Was this a, is this um, a psychologist or a cult expert that you would mind mentioning in case people were listening in the UK and wanted to seek their services as well? Or is that, would you rather not? I mean, if anyone wants to reach out to me, I'm more than happy to share okay. that. I mean, I don't, because I don't, they're, they're not people who uh, publicly speak out about against Scientology. Fair enough. Fair so enough. I don't want to throw them in it. But if someone does want to go through that process and needs help, in any way and feels like they benefit from it i'm more than happy to set up introductions and that sort of thing Would so you uh, mind if i included your email address in the description well, box what i was going to say is the discord so you oh, right. i don't know if you want to hey man that was a perfect discord. segue out of this interview <laughs> I got man, that's awesome <laughs> so we have a new uh discord server that angela is doing a fantastic job, not only of busting her ass to set it up, but creating a community over there. And apparently you and some other people had a really nice chat. And I can't wait to join you guys over there. I'm just getting um, used to Discord. I've never used it before, guys. Um, if you know about it, it seems like it's a pretty cool community where we can all meet up and chat. And also we're considering having a Battlefield Earth uh, watch party. We can watch Jason the Gay's video together. If you're an ex-JW, you don't even have to be an ex-cult member. You can just come hang out. But not just Scientologists. If you're an ex of any cult, any abusive relationship, or anything that kind of hits home, please come join us at Discord channel. There is a link in the description box, and it's all set up now for you guys to join us. Alexander, I, I really appreciate you coming on. Guys, we barely scratched the surface. I have notes about um, what we wanted to cover, but I knew we were going to get it out. And, you know, we've been going for an hour and 40 minutes now. So perfect ending point. I just wanted to say every time someone like you comes on and anybody speaks out, it, I do believe that it creates an effect and the next person waiting pops on to do the same thing. So I really appreciate your bravery, courage, and your articulation and being able to break down your experience. And I can't wait for part two because we barely got into this, guys. And he has a lot of interesting information to share, not just um, on what we talked about today, but specifically the recovery process, because I feel like we don't talk too much about solutions so i want to start hitting that more and this is the perfect guy to do that trust me so anything you want to say alexander before we uh end the session just <laughs> just just thank you for for the opportunity and thank you for doing what you do i think a, a lot of people who have youtube channels and all of this you don't you don't see the impact you have because a lot of people i was watching your videos and other videos for a really long time before i reached out really and so i That's think i i just want to validate you and Thanks, you know, make sure you're lot, aware that, that the help that you give people by providing this platform you might not necessarily see the impact but but trust me you know that's why i'm doing what i'm doing sharing my story because just hearing other people talk about it helps people realize they're not alone other people have gone through it and there is help out there and we're all here as a community and the discord okay, is one of the ways you can talk to people get to know people and and help you on your own journey so so just yeah thank you for the for the platform and for having me on fucking hey brother that was beautiful man i really appreciate that that does mean a lot to me i don't see the effect i'm so busy kind of in it and um it's really nice to hear that and it's great that we're creating a little community over there i love seeing that you over there for sure all new people and angela Thanks for setting that up. Goalie, as always, thanks for being such an awesome moderator. I don't know how you have the time to do Aaron's channel and mine. And, and uh, I mean, Aaron keeps you busy, man. You got to be over there every day, Goldie. Friends, please come back for part two. I promise you, man, we barely scratch the surface. And uh, have a good day, uh, you guys. And Alexander, you as well, man. I'll see you on the Discord channel. Thanks for tuning in, guys. All right, take care. Bye.